Welcome to AP European History with Dr. Brovkin and uh, Russian History with Dr. Brovkin. Today I continue with a series of lectures on the Civil War in Russia, and this could be called Part 2, uh, The White Tide in the South. In the preceding video, I talked about the uh, dramatic advance of Admiral Kolchak in Siberia, and the key thesis was that it was so successful because of the rebellions that were going on in the Volga region that made the advance of uh, Admiral Kolchak possible. In a very simplified way, my thesis today is the same. The historic offensive of General Dzinikin in the south of Russia uh, to the gates of Moscow by October 1919 was made possible by the uh, rebellions that were going on in Ukraine and in the south of Russia. But this is a much more simplified way. Uh, let me take you through uh, in, a very, in a much more detailed fashion who was rebelled, uh, when it was happened, what were the forces, and how exactly it played out. The problem, of course, is that the situation in the south of Russia was much more complicated than in the Volga, because in the Volga region, you basically had two opponents. You had the Bolshevik government uh, and its Red Army versus the uh, Kolchak government and his White Army. That was called White Volunteer Army of Officers. In Ukraine, it was much more complicated. So let's define the terms first. The, the first thing, of course, is there was no such thing as Ukraine at that time. Even the term Ukraine was not used. Uh, what we usually call Ukraine at that time was called Malorossia, which is small Russia, and it was in Novorossia, which is uh, the territory um, adjacent to Crimea in the Black Sea region. And then there were the Cossack lands that were not a part of Ukraine, the, not even at that time they were when the Ukraine People's Republic were formed, they were not a part of it. This is today's Donetsk region where you have so-called rebels. So this is the areas of the Don Cossacks and the Kubine Cossacks right next to them. And I'll define later, later who the Cossacks were. So let's list the political forces in what today would be called the territory of Ukraine, but at that time it was a small Russia or Malorossia or Western Ukraine, and then the, the, the Novorossia, which is New Russia, and that is, uh, uh, and then the Cossack lands. So there's three pieces of what today's map look, would say Ukraine. So here are the political forces that make it much more complicated. Uh, when the regime of General Skoropadsky fell, uh, that is a stooge regime, that is a puppet regime of the Germans, after the collapse of the Germans in World War I and the retreat of the German troops, you have a collapse of the Skoropadsky regime. And this is the, uh, let's say, December, uh, early January 1919. You have the following political forces in the territory that at that time was called South, South of Russia and today would be called Ukraine plus the Cossack lands. So you had several forces. Number one, you had the uh, forces of Ukrainian independent government that proclaimed independent uh, Ukrainian republic uh, that was uh, socialist in its composition with left SRs and, and Ukrainian SRs. It was a kind of a uh, similar to the kind of republic that was uh, emerged in Poland. Uh, then you had a very powerful force of independent, truly Ukrainian peasant bands. So these are very important political forces, and they, I will show you, were on their own. They were not under the government uh, of Ukraine independent force. So volunteer Ukrainian bands, that's force number two. Then you had volunteer of forces of Don and Kubine Cossacks. So the Cossacks were on their own. They are not a part of any government and they have their own armed force, which, which turned out to be very important and crucial. That's number three. Number four, you have white volunteer army. In other words, these are czarist officers. They're, they're very similar to the Kolchak. And at this time, they're led by General Dinikin, one of the most talented generals of, of, uh, of perhaps uh, definitely of that age. So that's number four. Number five, you have Moscow Bolsheviks, and their, their arm is the Ukrainian communist government that is set up in Kharkov. Uh, that's number five. All of these five are Russian, Russian Ukrainian forces, which are local forces. And then you have number six, which is the French Expeditionary Force. Uh, 
that landed in Ukraine, well, in Odessa, which actually was not at that time Ukraine, it was a Russian port, uh, in February 1919. So all that makes it very complicated because you have six political forces that are at odds with each other. Uh, very briefly, who is with whom, so that there's a kind of a clear picture. The forces of national Ukrainian independent, their leader is uh, Pitlura, were against the Bolsheviks and against the whites. Against the, the whites because the Tsarist officers wanted united, indivisible Russia. They wanted independent Ukraine, so they're against each other. Uh, the, the forces of volunteer detachments of Ukrainian peasants, they were at first with the Bolsheviks, and this is why they, they swept across Ukraine so quickly, but then very quickly they turned against them, and you have a kind of a war of these detachments against the Bolsheviks, which I'll come back to later. Then you have the White Volunteer Army. They are against the Bolsheviks and against the Ukrainian nationalists, but more against the Bolsheviks. They're going to make peace with the Ukrainian nationalists, and they are very friendly with the Cossacks, and they will join forces together with them. And then you have, of course, the French Expeditionary Force, which is against the Bolsheviks. It was sent to, to dispose of the Bolsheviks, but then they're overwhelmed by the Ukrainian uh, national uh, volunteer detachments of peasants, and they do support the whites. So this is the complexity of the situation. But let's now go chronologically what happens uh, uh, at which stage. As I mentioned earlier, the regime of Skaropatsky falls. And the next thing that happens, this is the phase one of the story I'm telling you, is that the Ukrainian bands are overrunning Ukraine uh, and they are now in support with the Bolsheviks of Moscow. So these are these are uh, essentially a two most important bands, and that is by Nik Nikifor Grigoryev, or in Ukrainian Grigoryev, and Nestor Makhno. Now, who are these people? They are leaders of volunteer, spontaneous peasant bands who just gang together, and there were about 20,000 in each of those, and there will be another one. And so they make peace with the Bolsheviks and joint cause with the Bolsheviks to push uh, the, um, to push the uh, French out. Uh, Lenin wrote uh, to his uh, Ukrainian, um, uh, Rakovsky, the head of the Ukrainian communist government, I quote, be very careful with Makhno uh, until, and be very diplomatic, until Rostov on Don is taken. Uh, so, so in other words, it's quite clear that the Bolsheviks in Moscow wanted to use these peasant bands in order to achieve their political objectives and conquer all of Ukraine, and specifically the independent Ukrainian government and the French. And, and that had been accomplished. By April, the bands of Grigoryev or Grigoryev did push out the French expeditionary force out uh, and took Odessa by basically putting an end to this very... Uh, a strange episode of the French intervention in the Russian Civil War. Um, uh, just a note about the French intervention. It was very poorly th thought out. They, they, they thought they could easily re replace the Germans in Ukraine and just push out the Bolsheviks. They couldn't match the Germans. They couldn't occupy Ukraine. It was a very, very hastily conducted operation with very little logistical support, and it was a complete disaster. And the French and the British quickly realized that they have really no way to, uh, by force, to, to force the Bolsheviks out. In any case, um, uh, what's important is that in February, in January and February, the, the uh, alliance of the Bolsheviks from Moscow and the Ukrainian peasant bands works very well and delivers all of Ukraine and of South Russia and of the Cossack lands to the Bolsheviks. So the so-called Soviet power is established in uh, in the south of Russia, Cossack lands, plus what today is called Ukraine, completely. The whites have absolutely no force whatsoever. They're totally defeated. Uh, the general Kornil of their leader, uh, the hero of 1917, is, is killed in action. And their bands of the white volunteer officers of the Tsarist army in the North Caucasus, locked in a few towns, hiding in the mountains. There's no way any one of them could seriously think that they had any chance 
chance whatsoever to advance in any serious way against the Bolsheviks, let alone approach Moscow. So this is the situation in February 1919. But then things begin to change and to change very drastically. And the most important one is that the Bolsheviks managed to antagonize just about everybody in the south of Russia and in Ukraine. And there's a kind of a falling out between them and Nestor Makhno, and there's a falling out between them and, and uh, Grigoryev, and there's a new band that is formed, and there are rebellions all over. Why is that? It's because the Bolsheviks come with the same kind of policies they've been practicing in Russia, which means uh, banning private enterprise, banning private lands, uh, fostering collective farms, requisitioning grain from the peasants, and installing the kind of ruthless Cheka terror against the local population, which generates spontaneous protests. Uh, so uh, here's an example. Uh, there was a Congress of uh, so independent uh, um, rebel forces, they were called, and peasants on the Nestor Makhno territory, which is the south of Russia uh, and the today's Donbass region. And this is what they say, February 1918, the second Congress of the peasants, rebels and workers in the Gulyai Pole area, which is Makhno's home base, resolution stated, quote, since land is nobody's and since only those who till it should have the right to use it, all land must be owned by the lamb laboring peasantry of Ukraine and distributed freely and equally. So, of course, the Bolsheviks had no uh, plans to distribute the land and they disbanded this Congress. And that way they basically declared war on, on Nestor Makhno and he started his uh, re rebellion. Uh, so I read you another one of the uh, resolution at this Congress, which, which shows the political attitudes of the peasants in South Russia and in Ukraine uh, it, at this time. Quote, we protest against the reactionary habits of the Bolshevik rulers, commissars and agents of the Cheka who are shooting workers, peasants and rebels, inventing all kinds of excuses. And that is confirmed by the documents we have. The Cheka, which were supposed to struggle with counter-revolution when with banditry, have turned into the Bolsheviks' hands in the instrument of the suppression of the will of the people. They have grown in some cases to the detachment of several hundred men uh, with a variety of arms. We demand that all these forces be dispatched to the front. In other words, uh, there's a growing discontent. To make a long story short, uh, basically in the time of April is the time of mass rebellions of uh, Cossacks, Russian peasants and Ukrainian peasants in the south of Russia and in Ukraine. Poltava, peasants' disposition is anti-Soviet, although there are no open rebellions of yet. Kharkov, in some volusty of the province, the peasant rebellions in connection with the mobilization. Alexandrovsky Uyest, Yekartina Inaslav. The political situation is in the yes heart. The influence of anarchists and leftist Tsars is very strong, which prevents implementation of the mobilization. Propagandized peasants refuse to deliver grain and food to the cities. Uh, so uh, the, these reports, and I have many, many others in my book from the official archives uh, of the uh, Ukrainian front, it was called. Here's one. In the entire space, between Gomel and Chernigov, the peasants' political disposition is unquestionably anti-Bolshevik. They're waiting for the arrival of Dinikin eagerly. Uh, so uh, what I've tried to show you now is that in this period, uh, there is a growing rebellion against the Bolsheviks and their policies by the people of Russia and by the Ukrainian peasants. Uh, and uh, the mention of Dinikin is very important because he was going to be the beneficiary uh, of, this, um, of this movement. Here is official data from the Bolshevik Stab Ukrainskova Fronta, which is the headquarters of the Ukrainian Front. Makhno band is 20,000 people. Uh, Hrigoryev band is 20,000 people. Zelony, this is another peasant leader, 15,000 people. According to Rakovsky, who is the official head of the communist government of Ukraine, entire Ukraine rose against the Bolsheviks. This is his words in April 19, uh, 1919. 
the peasant slogans were, it's interesting, down with the communists or Soviets without the communists. We will see that slogan reappear later during the civil war. In April 1919, 93 separate armed rebellions against the Soviet power in Ukraine. So, so here's come my, my final thesis, which I outlined in the beginning. It is due to these rebellions that one organized force made good use of, and that is the White Army of General Dinikin. In other words, General Dinikin is pouring into the areas afflicted by anti-Bolshevik rebellions of peasants who had had enough of the Red Terror, grain requisitioning, and the Cheka rule instead of free Soviets and uh, land the, that the Bolsheviks promised to the peasants. Uh, one other thing that's important to mention, Ukrainian peasants are a little bit more feisty than the Russian ones because they have the tradition of autonomy, just like the, uh, the, the Cossacks, uh, and they're used to having much more independence. Uh, and then the Russian peasants were. And in that sense, it's not surprising that in the south of Russia, in Ukrainian and in Cossack lands, uh, you have a, a spontaneous uh, response in a mass scale that is uh, uh, overthrowing the Bolshevik rule. And finally, the question that Ukrainian scholars and historians are posing, why is it that these Ukrainian bands uh, joined the Bolsheviks rather than independent uh, Republic that that, uh, that that was proclaimed, led by Petlura. Why is it that the Bolsheviks used this peasant anger to overthrow and drive off the independent Ukrainian uh, Republic at that time? And and the second question that needs to be posed, it, why is it that it is General Dinikin, who had no chance whatsoever, that actually benefited from the peasant rebellions and not somebody else? Well, the simple answer, and I'll come back to it later, the simple answer is that this is the most organized and professional force that existed at the time. And this is why they were able to just join in, drive in and establish, uh, you know, administration uh, and the collection of resources much better than anybody else. And in that sense, they kind of uh, benefited more than anybody else uh, from the peasant attitudes, both in the Cossack lands and in the uh, Ukraine proper in order to uh, drive the Bolsheviks uh, to almost to the gates of Moscow and stage a spectacular offensive uh, uh, that really gave, uh, if there was one chance, it was this chance that the whites had to win in the civil war and drive the Bolsheviks out of Moscow. Uh, and I'll come back to the Denikin's offensive in my next video. And at that time, subscribe to my channel. Thank you. Bye-bye.